Okay, so first, uh, keynote speaking, let's welcome Professor Yu Ying Yan to start his keynote speech from the University of Nottingham. Welcome. Okay, my presentation Great. is about Explored Nature Inspired Solution for Sustainable Development. I hope this talk will be interested by our University Islands of the Silk Road. University of Nottingham is a leading research university, but also we promote nature. So we have a, a beautiful campus and the greenest campus in the world. Nature is always time to be act in the simplest way. The nature plant and animals do not waste, but a time to save energy because they interact effectively with the surrounding environment and they exchange the energy and the mass flow across their cuticles, specifically micro and even nanoscale structures and the functions to achieve the perfect energy balance. So in the ancient, so we have the pioneer of uh, Chinese company, Lu Ban. He designed the source, but inspired from the natural plant. And also we can see a lot of other examples nowadays about new technologies and the development of the from nature. We can overview the various objects from the nature and their selected functions. So this could be from bacteria, plants, and insects, spiders, and uh, uh, acoustic animals, and the bird. We can see in the desert, the desert plant, they only need a very little amount of water to life because they evoluted over millions of millions of years. We have done some work using our MI uh, is uh, image and uh, facility. And also we can see uh, in the world, the bird and the seabird, and also like uh, uh, the dolphin and uh, uh, king gray. They have their selected functions. The seabird only need a very small amount of the food, they can fly the long journey. And pingree and also dolphin, they had their own structure. So for the furs and the blubbers and to perfect insulate and for the heat loss. We can see the plant and the bacteria and the, even the aquatic animals. They all have the selection functions. We are particularly interested about the plant boundary layer and under the, the uh, hydrophobic or microstructural balance. And they can see the transport barriers to limit the uncontrolled water loss. For example, the surface wettability, anti adhesion or safe cleaning properties and so on. I start to be interested in the uh, biomimetics from 2002. So this is a rural society has a report over research on the excellent in science, the mimic from nature. So that work is pioneered by the Chinese scientist, the professor, uh, academician, Professor Lu Chen Ren. And he and his team had the first uh, uh, invent about uh, to identify what is the uh, uh, loss is uh, the uh, earthworm, the effect. The earthworm has a perfect function of anti adhesion. We know when the people working in the mud and the machine working in the mud, they have a lot of problem of stinking, but earthworms do not have such problem. So we mimic from this 
and who designed the useful machine and to protect the anti-adhesion and also reduce the resistance that make the machine more sustainable. Another pioneer for the lot of the leaf effect is a Professor Basrot from the University of Bonn. And he designed or invent about or first report the effect of a lot of leaf. The lotus leaf has a perfect cipher cleaning structures. Uh, that is because of the micro nanoscale or structural morphologies. When we talk about the topic of how nature could help to improve sustainable, and we can see uh, uh, we have uh, faced a lot of challenges. Like uh, you know, we we need a self cleaning uh, facility, a uh, glasses function of for high rise building, and we need a low resistance for the uh, the uh, you know the uh, oil transformation, and also we need a self cleaning function of for facility and for the you know the large scale for uh, solar PV farm. Typically, in the place of has a, a good resources of sunshine, but has a, 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 a heavy pollution damages. Also, we need a, a low resistance of surface, and that is for a safe, uh, has a low drag and a low energy consumption. So, some work we have done uh, over the last. Uh, uh, 15 years or 20 years, we developed the uh, first so called um, the self cleaning surface and also uh, the super hydrophobic or, or, or the hexogenous surface. And first of all, enhance the nuclear boiling and also uh, improve uh, the low energy surface cooling and try to improve the latent frost uh, temperature or, or effect. Uh, and the morphological development of fuel drop uh, on, the, on the surface for cooling. Another very important uh, uh, phenomenon we face is about uh, icing and the frost. Uh, this has uh, uh, bring the human beings a lot of problem. We suffer from and uh, frost and icing uh, for the automotive, uh, for the airplane, and for the air conditionings. And uh, this is actually largely, uh, you know, uh, re resulting the problem for the uh, efficient energy use and for for uh, you know sustainable development. But actually, we can find the nature solutions. And one of the solutions from you know the Ipin plant from the uh, highland of, of Tanya, for example, and this is actually plant do not have a problem. We we can explore these uh, nature uh, functions and also uh, help to develop and to get rid of the uh, the frost and icing problem. And. The, the approach is we we have developed the, the surface, a functional surface, and on the basis of uh, you know the the interactions for the the morphologies and the physics uh, for the job and the surface interactions, and uh, we have published a number of papers to tackle this problem, and also developed technologies about uh, uh, the fabricate the surface of uh, on, on the the metal surface and this could be the uh, become the anti frost or of a hydro uh, what's called the anthophobic surface and uh, this will be delayed the icing bridge and break the icing bridge so that is a uh, uh, makes the melt and uh, uh, so have to tackle the problem. Another important uh, the problem is uh, we we should tackle the climate change. The climate change and uh, is uh, uh, is one of the most important uh, the problem and all this, and we need to uh, tackle for the sustainable development. And in most of uh, you know, uh, I think uh, along the uh, self world countries. 
and about uh, uh, how to uh, tackle the, the the climate increase in the summer and uh, how to uh, get rid of the you know deal, deal with the cooling uh, or cold uh, date climate in the winter. So we could learn something from nature. And uh, recently uh, funded by Rural Society and China Natural Science Foundation, and we collaborated between the University of Nottingham and the Harbin Institute of Technology, we try to tackle this problem. So one of uh, we can learn it from nature is uh, uh, the 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 seal ank from the Africa Sahara uh, Sahara Desert. Uh, that's the inhabit one of the the hottest, you know, uh, terrestrial environment on the earth. So desert, uh, the surface could be uh, the temperature could be higher as a hot as about sixty to seventy degrees centigrade, and the unbody temperature will be about uh, you know fifty degrees centigrade. So the ant is uh, occasionally unloaded the excess heat by uh, posing on the top of a stone or, or dried or vegetation uh, of a considerable low temperature. And so this ant may result to this uh, thermal uh, respite up to 70% of their entire uh, for ranging time. So this is actually, you can see the structure of the, the, uh, the civil ant is about the triangles. And this is a and using the, the, the mechanism of uh, through the series of optical and the thermal uh, investigate, and they, they found they actually can uh, reflect in the large portion of solar radiation in a visible uh, and near infrared range of the spectrum and the radiating heat uh, to the surrounding. Uh, environment by enhanced uh, emissivity in the, the mid infrared. So when the black body uh, radiation spectrum of the ant body uh, culminates So this is the use of the high uh, reflectivity of the solar spectrum band that is a 0.3 to 2.5 uh, micrometers and the high emissivities of uh, in the atmospheric uh, atmospheric window band is about uh, 8 to 13 um, micrometers. So uh, use these uh, functions and uh, for uh, the applications to you know transportations and. Uh, 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 all your, uh, you know, dipole and the buildings, and that could be uh, supplied the uh, so-called uh, radiator cooling. So make the surface and using the uh, atmospheric windows band and uh, using the, the uh, coating the surface and uh, uh, supply the, the radiator cooling. The recent progress is uh, has been uh, so survey developed the coating and on the different uh, uh, building and the test and the mass of indoor average air temperature uh, on the painted building can be reduced by six point two degrees C and the maximum power saving uh, you know from the air conditioning could be about fifty percent and also we are developing the further uh, coating. And that could be uh, avoid too hot, and uh, because uh, sometimes in the in the summer area, in like in Europe and the East Europe, and uh, that could be the uh, because the radiator cooling that make the building too cold. So that will be we 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 are applied to the change the color and the mimic from nature and the change the color because some animals could change the colors and uh, and uh, change the color and the, and the radiation. So, so that could be uh, protect the temperature in the the retinamidum state. The finally is about high temperature thermal energy storage. This is the urgent. Uh, uh, you know, uh, challenge for uh, energy 
uh, applications because, uh, for example, the solar energy, solar farm, we need to improve uh, the uh, the solar uh, the the thermal energy storage at uh, high temperatures. But the problem is about the salt and uh, when they melt in the liquid state uh, leaking. So we need to urgent develop uh, our material that is, uh, for example, ceramic that could be uh, in a nano micro or nano structures, but uh, also we need to avoid the leaking. So this is the way uh, we started from the nature and nature inspired some solutions. So for example, we can see some plant, they like, uh, uh, they have the poor structure and also some plant has a good uh, skin and that could be avoid leaking. So we have a uh, uh, mimic this technology and uh, also uh, develop uh, the, the, the temperature evolution uh, melt fraction for, for the ceramic form and, and the salt composite. So that is uh, uh, has been quite successful and, uh, and the thermal conductivity of the, the solar salt has been uh, significantly improved and uh, then improved the technology. So uh, quickly, I would like to just uh, uh, draw a, a solution, a conclusion. So uh, we can say uh, basically uh, nature often offer the interesting and the excellent solution for complex problem. And the study nature solution could bridge the gap between the micro and engineering problem and the micro nanoscale problem. And also uh, we can see the nature solution could help improve a successful development and uh, more work to be done obviously for the challenge energy storage. So because of time limit, so I can't uh, you know uh, give uh, uh, much detail, but I just would like to outline and uh, how we can learn from nature and for the, to tackle the problem of environment and the energy uh, efficiency problem. I uh, hope that would be helpful for, for the sustainable development. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much, Professor Yan. And uh, we can learn a lot from the nature, just like what you present, like the boiling process and like the, you know, the energy storage and also the heat transfer enhancement. So due to the time limited, I know that you have a lecture. So thank you very much. We will leave message to you if we have further questions. Thank you very much. You're so welcome. Here we go to... Yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Professor Yan. We appreciate it for your time, really. So second one, uh, you know, the presenter is the Professor Paul Auckland, and uh, he is, you know, works at the Institute of Thermal Power Engineering in the Quarko University of Technology. And uh, his research topics include like energy system analysis, the underground energy systems, optimization of thermal systems like exchanger, the heating networks, the power, uh, some, some other power systems, and also the CFD simulation devices. Today, his topic is the renewable energy systems for building heating and the electrical energy production. So let's welcome Professor Auckland. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I would like to thank to, uh, to the organizers for inviting me, and I would like to ask the question: If you see my presentation, yes, clearly. Great, thank you very much. So it's a pleasure to present the uh, presentation on the International USR Summit on Education and Action for a Sustainable Future. My presentation uh, is titled. Renewable energy system for building heating and electrical energy production. So, I would like to tell that it was prepared with the help of my colleagues from the energy department from the Faculty of Environmental and Power Engineering from Krakow University of Technology, Poland. And they are Philip Bartizel, Piotr Cisek, and Mehmet Ali Yildrim. So, I'm really leading this team and I would like to tell a few words about the project. Uh, the Reshit project is a is a uh, project uh, funded by European Union, European Commission from the Horizon 2020 funds. We have the consortium with Sapienza University of Rome from Italy, with Bruno University of Technology from Czech Republic, 
there are universities, there are also involved uh, companies like Oilon, which is producing the heat pumps from Finland, Chamara company, which is producing, developing this underground uh, thermal energy storage facilities and automation control for the system. Elfram Frank Szczesławicz from Poland, which is developing the Santrax solution. And also uh, we have uh, building operators uh, like Municipal Building Management Board in Krakow City in Poland and other provincia di Rome in Italy, which is has a similar role, but for the Lazio region. So the project received the funding from European Union. And what is the concept in, in this system is uh, that we are using solar energy as a primary source of the renewable energy for producing electricity from PV modules. And uh, we are also applying solar tracking systems to reduce the space and uh, to increase the efficiency also more efficient use of solar energy to the use of pvt panels which is the combination of pv and solar panels this cooling of the pv panels with the pvt allows to decrease the panel surface temperature and increase the electrical energy production we are use, uh, making the building heating and cooling using the heat pump we are also storing the heat in the energy storage tanks underground and also use the waste heat from Santrac uh, solar PVT panels uh, for the soil regeneration. This is quite important because we need to achieve the high COP coefficient of performance of the heat pump in the subsequent heating seasons. Uh, therefore, regenerating this ground, the ground allows to achieve this uh, goal and to not decrease the efficiency of the system. So the system works like this, that we have ground source heat pump. We have also control panel, which is selecting the best, the highest temperature source site of the heat, uh, like for example, boreholes or underground storage unit. And from the PVT panels, the heat goes to the heat accumulator, which is not insulated, and it transfers the heat to the ground. And then in the summertime, the ground is heated. And in the winter time and autumn, some of this heat can be restored and reused with uh, the heat transfer uh, to not decrease too much the temperature from the storage tank. Of course, when there are no ground waters. And uh, this heat can be used by the heat pump as a source uh, site. Also, to domestic hot water preparation, we are using the Santrax solar collectors. There is the underground heat storage tank, which is insulated. And then we are using it, uh, storing it underground, and then using it in the time when it's needed. So the major goals of the projects are a development of heating and hot water preparation system to cover at least 70% of the annual energy demand for multifamily residential building from renewables, to demonstrate the actual performance of the system and provide the end user information on the overall performance, demonstrate the scalability of the system for different types of multifamily residential buildings. To, we'll have the three demos, uh, one in Italy with 13 apartments and uh, two in Poland, in Krakow with 24 apartments in Limanova with seven apartments. And this will demonstrate as application of the system for heating and cooling uh, in Krakow will be using it for heating and domestic hot water protection in Limanova and in Palombara Sabrina for heating and cooling. And also we'll evaluate the economic efficiency, life cycle assessment and environmental impact of the system. What is important here, because we know actually in the family houses, uh, people are using this uh, photovoltaics and heat pump combination, but uh, uh, this is difficult to come to the buildings which are older, which are multifamily and uh, uh, which have existing heating systems like boilers, like uh, heating network systems. So this project uh, aims to move to this barrier and to implement the system there. And uh, we have the value chain of the project like this, that they, there are uh, universities which are developing the Technology like Krakow University of Technology is designing the system. Sapienza University of Rome is uh, making building and uh, energy analysis. Brno University of Technology is doing LCA and eco cost analysis. 
There are system components, uh, manufacturers like Elfran, sun tracking, uh, PVT panels and solar collectors, oil on, high temperature ground source heat pumps and Chamara, this underground storage unit with the automation and control. There is a company which is integrating the system, like Chamara company, and there are distributing the uh, system components and the overall system like Elfran, Chamara and Oilon. We, are, we have also end users on the board, municipal buildings, the partner of Kraków and other Provincia di Roma. So the project has complete value chain. First of all, I would like to tell a few words about Soundtrack PVT. This is a uh, they were developed during the High Sol uh, project, which was funded by National Research and Development Center of Poland. We developed a new cooling system for PV modules, and we designed it, the, the cooling system to, which is efficient for various types of PV modules. Also, the new reliable drive for PV sun tracking was developed, which allows efficient and low energy consumption. There is also developed the demo site at the district fire station in Oświęcim in Poland to show the efficiency. So here we have the view of this demo site. Here we have Suntrack solar uh, PVT panels and stationary PVT panels with the same net power, electrical power output, nine kilowatts. Here is the building. And from the measurements, what we can see is that the sun tracking allows us to get 34% more of the electrical energy than stationary PVT modules. And also the uh, thermal power, uh, thermal energy yield is increased by 85% compared to the stationary PVT modules by this sun tracking. And we have quite a lot of low temperature heat, uh, 35, 40 centigrade. And we were developing this system during the another project of National Center of Research and Development of Poland, we built a prototype of this rescue project, uh, which uh, was installed in uh, Limanova in uh, southern Poland with the Suntrack solar uh, PVT panels, Suntrack solar collectors, and stationary PVT panels, and also underground storages. What uh, here, is, here we can see how it looks like. We have here 10 Suntrack solar collectors for Suntrack PVT modules with the thermal power with the electrical power output of 16 uh, kilowatts and stationary PVT modules with an electrical power output of 32 kilowatts. We have also these uh, underground storages, uh, which we can see, for example, here. Uh, they are installed uh, here under the basement. And then the system was tested. What we can see from it is that we are able to achieve quite good uh, COP coefficient of the performance of the system over 5.6. What was the possibility is that uh, because uh, we are using the floor heating and wall heating, so the load temperature is uh, quite low, 35, uh, 40 centigrade is the maximum. So uh, this uh, COP was uh, high, but actually if we have the challenge because we have older building built in 2013 with 24 apartments. There is a natural gas boiler. Here we have the photo from the installation of Suntrack solar collectors. And also if we have here the photovoltaics installed. We'll uh, try to compare the results of the experimental after the project, uh, during the project with the another building, the same building with the same size and the same gas system. Uh, when we are replacing in the project the gas uh, boiler with the ground source heat pump with heat storage. This will tell us how are the benefits. So uh, we are planning this installation with the, the following parameters. Suntrack solar collectors with 30.4 uh, kilowatt of thermal power output, eight peaks, uh, Suntrack PVT panels uh, with the electrical power output of 10.4 kilowatts, stationary PV panels, a heat pump, underground storage, 50 cubic meters and ground heat exchangers. This uh, setup is a little bit uh, oversized. The, the reason is simple because we want to make it uh, the, deliver the heat mostly from this rescue project nearly 100 percent. Therefore, we needed to oversize it to allow be used by the heat pump both for boreholes and uh, accumulation uh, unit. But 
uh, here we have this scheme of the system uh, which uh, we are planning to do and we have done this simulation in the transit model develop the mathematical model of the building in SketchUp software with the following uh, parameters of the walls and uh, facades and uh, envelope of the building and uh, we have also developed the model of the system with uh, this PVT uh, panels, uh, heat pump, uh, solar collectors uh, and underground storages and we perform the uh, simulation to design this system. At the beginning we validated the model of the building which we can see from the uh, simulation we get uh, the value of the energy demand, the energy demand of 108.1 megawatt, sorry, uh, from the measurements 1.108.1 megawatt hour per year, and from the simulation 109.8 megawatt hour, so the model can be quite good. And we have also calculated the uh, average yearly heat pump COP, because uh, in the project uh, it was needed to have it over the four, we implemented the control system in the transits to prioritize the highest temperature source. And then it was possible to obtain quite good uh, values here. And also, uh, here is the thermal energy produced by the solar uh, collectors, uh, which is uh, possible to be observed and it's uh, nearly 41.8 megawatt hours. So in fact, Part of it we are using for the actual demand, majority of it. Some of them we are storing in the stacks. And also, amount of the electricity produced, uh, we are producing nearly 40 megawatt hours per year. And for the heat pump, it's needed uh, less than 20 megawatt hours to deliver the building heating. Uh, and uh, in fact, for this high COP of, COP of the heat pump. In fact, we are covering more than 200% of the uh, electrical energy demand of the building and uh, of, of, the, of the system. And uh, therefore, this is quite, uh, quite good result. Here we can see how much uh, electrical energy is produced uh, from the PV panels and from the PVT panels. Of course, there are larger amount of uh, PV panels than Soundtrack PVT. So this is a value of the PV generation, stationary PV generation is higher. But what we are, we have done also, we have validated various models of the heat pump, uh, Soundtrack solar collectors, Soundtrack PVT modules, building undergo thermal energy storage tank and heat pump ground heat exchanger. The data was delivered to me by, to us by oil on company. We were able to compare the measurement results with the simulation and we can here see uh, for the heating power electrical power output uh, quite good agreement with the measurements also for the outlet temperature for the lower source of the heat pump uh, and with the respect to inlet temperature of the, to the lower source of the heat pump we can see quite good uh, quite good uh, validation and for the soundtrack solar collectors, we were also able to make some measurements to validate how it looks like solar collector inlet temperature and outlet temperature compared with the simulated simulated data is compared with the measured data. We see quite good agreement. The similar here it is in the other day of the year. Also. For the soundtrack PVT panels, we are able to see how the temperature looks like in various hours. We have uh, quite good uh, values uh, compared with the measurements and also heat yield uh, is quite uh, close and electrical energy yield of uh, when comparing measured data and simulation. So also for the underground energy storage tank, because it is insulated, then it was quite easy to make this comparison here. And we can see very, very small errors compared to the measurements in various days of the year. Ground heat exchanger also 
more whole heat exchangers uh, were able to make the comparison with the experimental uh, results and transit models uh, and uh, in uh, 15 hours of the day we were able to compare the temperatures outer temperature uh, values which were quite close and um, finally uh, we can see here the value of the heat pump COP which is uh, depending on the number of solar collectors and underground storage tank capacity we can see that majority time we are able to achieve the value higher than four which is uh, which was our goal of course this demands uh, higher value of the storage tank capacity and also number of solar collectors and uh, and also here we present the demand coverage electrical energy production so for various uh, underground storage tank capacity and number of solar collectors uh, and uh, uh, this is uh, possible to be observed that uh, it's uh, quite high and now with uh, various number of soundtrack pvt uh, modules uh, this soundtrack solution we are also checking the heat pump cop which should be higher than four in the majority of the cases it is and uh, for uh, the, the electrical energy demand coverage also uh, we are able to obtain uh, quite high values here frankly speaking uh, to cover only the heating it would be uh, one pvt soundtrack pvt and five soundtrack solar collectors and tank capacity of 20 cubic meters would be sufficient but uh, what we need we are trying to make this coverage as high as possible actually so uh, we are using more of them and also to have the safety margin so to conclude our demo site in Krakow was simulated and uh, based on the results we are able to achieve 100 percent of the thermal energy demand coverage from the renewables the heat pump COP can be higher than four and the system installation in Krakow city is ongoing should be finished by the end of this year to validate our design and this system rescue system is an opportunity for the industry and SMEs companies facing energy transition I would like to thank you for your attention I would like to thank also European Commission for supporting our project and also thank the National Center for Research and Development of Poland that allowed us to do two previous projects previously which allow us to move the TRL level of the solutions to level of seven to allow actually uh, working close to the market implementation. Thank you so much, and uh, I'm happy for the questions. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Auckland. And I saw you that you uh, make a hybrid utilization for the solar, like the underground energy, and also to make the performance like a zero carbon, like the consumption buildings. That's wonderful, amazing result. And thank you very much for your time in the. Uh, so we go on the presentation. So next presenter is Professor and also Mrs. Vivian Lin Lu. And she is a highly cited researcher by Clavery Analytic in Engineering in 2018, and also a world top two, top two percent scientist by the Stanford University in energy in 2021 and 22. And she also a active professor and a researcher in the building engineering she received a lot of you know the uh certifications from the uh over the world including like the achievement in the research funding of the poly u and also the award you know from the 44 international exhibition innovations of Geneva and uh, and so on and with over 250 ICI journal publications, very you know, active. Her research includes the renewable energy technology and also application in buildings and fundamental research in the fluid dynamics, fluid mechanics, and heat transfer enhancement in building energy, in building energy systems. So let's welcome Professor Vivian Lin Du. 
to give a presentation. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Chu, uh, for your nice introduction. Also, thank you for this invitation. It's my great honor to share my researches and my perspectives on solar power generation technologies and how to integrate this technology into our buildings. Sure, from Professor Yan and uh, pro from Professor Okalan, and I also learned a lot about how to learn from nature, how to utilize solar energy. Okay, uh, so I'm from Hong Kong. And uh, so firstly, I will give a very short brief about incoming solar energy. Then we know that in fact, the sunlight, uh, so for one and a half hour, it is enough to provide the entire world's energy consumption for a whole year. So therefore, how to utilize solar energy in a smart and uh, in a smart manner is very important. So, but before that, we have to understand the solar spectrum. So we can see the solar spectrum, in fact, is from uh, several uh, uh, nanometer to 100 micrometer. However, so for us, due to the intensity, we merely care about the solar spectrum from 250 nanometer to three micrometer. And the then we look at the working principle for solar cell. Then we understand is there is a, a photon electric effect from Albert Einstein and also uh, later uh, from uh, from the scientists, uh, other scientists, the photovoltaic effect. Then we how the we how the work uh, we found that the photons of sunlight strike some specific materials, then electrons will be emitted. If we collect the electrons and connect it to external circuit, then we have currents. However, not all the sunlight uh, can, the photons from sunlight can strike, can emit the electrons, can release the electrons. Then we have to uh, know about the photon energy. So, in fact, uh, for solar cell, uh, for the common types of solar cell, uh, we have a uh, five main uh, types. Uh, in fact, uh, they, they are mainly belong to silicon solar cells and thin film solar cells. So they can be flexible, they can be colorful. Okay. And uh, however, we have to understand that because uh, when we are working on solar cell material development, and also uh, when we want try to install the solar PV technology into our buildings, we have to understand that the efficiency, the power efficiency, conversion efficiency is relatively low for all existing commercial uh, solar PV solar cells and solar PV panels. That's due to the uh, shock lay uh, quasius efficiency limit. So therefore we can see the maximum uh, highest uh, conversion efficiency for silicon cellar, solar cell is only around 30%. So due to other losses, uh, in fact, that's the reason from the commercial market, our solar PV panels, their efficiencies only are ranging from 10 to 20% in the commercial market. So there are many scientists try to uh, uplift this, uh, break this limit, okay? Try to uh, improve its efficiency. So therefore we have to look at that for different types of solar PV panels. In fact, they have different uh, band gap. So for silicon, its band gap is around one. So therefore, uh, is uh, if the make, if the, for the sunlight, if it's, uh, uh, if it's if its spectrum is uh, the wavelength is larger than uh, 1.1 micrometer, so the infrared solar energy cannot be used for power generation. So therefore, we have to be careful because later I will share with you uh, why. Uh, so the operating solar cell under the strong sunshine always very hot. That is because the efficiency is low, only 10, 10 to 20 percent. Then where's the rest energy? So the rest energy will be converted into heat. So the operating solar cell usually very hot. So then uh, look at in engineering for our application. Sure, this is a solar cell. We have to fabricate. Uh, we have to make, make the module uh, weatherproof. Okay, 
for the optical power generation. So therefore, we have solar cell, we have solar PV modules, we have our solar PV system. So then our system can provide us uh, energy supply. So here I give uh, you a brief of uh, um, our background of the develop uh, of the application and the development of a solar cell. So we we see the first silicon based solar cell. Then firstly, it was applied on space satellite until uh, so 1970s. We have uh, this technology was commercialized, and then in fact in 1990s, from the large scale power plants, our solar PV panels uh, they can be integrated into our buildings. So and now, in fact, we have lots of emerging solar PV technologies. We have to look at how to utilize the solar energy in a smart way. So in fact, today I would mainly share with you about BRPV technology and my perspective for the future. So why we have BRPV technology? Because for cities, we are lack of land. So therefore, we integrate solar PV modules into our buildings. We provide electricity at the point of use. And sure, it can replace the conventional building envelope uh, elements and also provide uh, noise control and the shading, etc. So look at the here, we can see that many types of different uh, applications, uh, including a vertical curtain wall, a sawtooth curtain wall, and the semi-transparent glazing, and also direct integrated uh, PV roof and the solar uh, solar tile from Tesla from Elon Musk's company. So we can see. Uh, we can integrate solar PV modules into our buildings in a different way. And for me, I, I will not share, and due to a uh, time limitation, I would just like share some uh, some of my research. Uh, I conducted researches on BIPV technology. I think almost 20 years. Okay, I have a lot, uh, many publications. So I would like to share with you is about development potential for Hong Kong for the rooftop building. So if we install uh, the solar PV panels on the building roofs in Hong Kong, so we uh, what's the uh, percentage it can contribute to our uh, energy uh, uh, share. So therefore, firstly, we have to use different technologies and the data sources to identify uh, the buildings with the roofs, which can be used for solar PV installation. So we have very critical criteria because we have to consider a surrounding sh a shading and the area and the slope of our building roof and also um, and also the uh, uh, received solar radiation, uh, etc. Then uh, we uh, using different technologies and based on different uh, technology and the data sources, we found in Hong Kong, in fact, the total PV uh, suitable roof uh, top area was estimated to be around 40 square kilometers. And then this area, we optimally install our solid solar PV panels in facing south with an optimal inclined angle. So I would like to merely share with you our finger. In fact, uh, even in Hong Kong, so we can see uh, if we install solar PV panels on the roof, we know Hong Kong is very dense cities. And so uh, in fact, 35% uh, buildings uh, based on our study, which can be used for rooftop uh, solar PV panel uh, installation. And uh, we can supply over 10 11% of total electricity of Hong Kong. So if we integrate solar PV panels, uh, so uh, as, as building facade, sure, this finger can be much larger. So lastly, I would like to share with you about uh, uh, my perspectives. So sure, uh, besides the solar cell uh, material development, in fact, uh, uh, we also, uh, in recent years, we know there is an emerging market for bifacial solar PV panels. And sure, as I mentioned, solar PV cell, solar cells are very hot so, uh, during operation. So therefore, we are thinking about um, how to use the solar energy smartly. So we can, we I think in the future, so we can work on solar PVT in the smart way. And sure, if our PV modules are in outdoor environment, it becomes very dirty. Sure, it can be self-cleaned. Even Professor Yan shared their self-cleaned uh, self, self uh, modules. 
And also, it is very hot. So we will think about if we have can provide passive cooling, if we can provide self cooling, so with the spectrum uh, 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 coating development. And also, you think the, the colors are dull. So therefore, I think one future for building integration is the color solar PV technology. So very quickly, I shared with you, uh, okay, is the bifacial uh, PV technology. So we can see this is a mono, um, mono uh, type of uh, uh, the conventional one, are uh, usually at the mono side. Uh, solar PV panels. So for the bifacial solar PV modules, uh, both sides can receive solar energy and can convert them into electricity. So therefore, especially when the PV modules with the installed and inclined angle, and also especially uh, vertically, uh, we can see here it is uh, it, it is vertically uh, installed, then uh, we can have a different out of peak. And uh, this gain is very high. So why we have solar uh, bifacial PV technology? That's due to the advancement of solar cell development. So for example, like the PERC technology make it possible. Two sides can receive solar energy and can convert it into uh, electricity. And uh, uh, there is one ongoing project for me, bifacial uh, uh, PV technologies. So we found that in fact uh, the gain. So compared with the mono side, mono uh, facial uh, PV modules by facial can um, generate more than up to uh, more than eighty percent of power uh, increase uh, output increase. And uh, also, as I mentioned, our solar PV cells very very hot. So we are thinking about how to utilize the thermal energy in a smart manner. So there it comes uh, the technology of solar PVT with this combination of power generation and the thermal energy utilization. And uh, sure, uh, so there are many, many ways to utilize the thermal energy. So, but it's not very um, commercialized and very popular due to some technical te uh, limitations, uh, especially like uh, there is a non-uniform temperature distribution of the uh, solar uh, the solar PV panels. And uh, also, if we provide um, a thermal utilization and utilization, it can still not uh, solve the problem of non-uniform temperature distribu distribution. So I, I also have one ongoing project is I want to provide uniform cooling of solar, solar PV uh, panels. And also at the same time, we can utilize the thermal energy in a smart way. So the solar power gen solar energy utilization ratio can be increased to 70%. Sure. So the our PV modules in our outdoor environment usually very dirty. So then we can think about the solution for the self-cleaning PV modules. In fact, my group had developed several types of self-cleaning coatings, uh, super hydrophobic, super hydrophobic. They are all transparent. So we can see uh, with our self-cleaning coating, the PV modules, okay, very clean and uh, definitely can generate a lot uh, more uh, power generation and very clean. And sure, uh, so look at the hot solar cell. I'm also thinking about we can also provide passive radiative uh, cooling, uh, coating, okay, onto the glass of solar PV panels to cool down our co our solar hot solar cell in a smart way. So sure, uh, I know some professors had uh, published some uh, researches already. However, uh, we are still have lots of issues we need to further discuss. And uh, um, as I also mentioned, because of the conventional commercial solar PV pa panels, uh, the colors are in blue. Okay, and uh, so how to make it colorful and make our buildings colorful and very uh, attractive and very pretty appearance of our, our building. So then, in fact, uh, um, I have my research collaborators. We also uh, tried to seek for solutions. Uh, we de developed different uh, colored uh, solar, P solar, 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 solar PV uh, modules and uh, even with other different patterns. 
Uh, okay, uh, I think in the future, I think that there is also a still ongoing projects uh, at the moment. So we can together uh, work together. So for uh, for the solution. And uh, to conclude, in fact, uh, I do think uh, how to utilize solar energy in a smart way is very important because solar energy is very abundant. How to use solar energy in a smart way is very important. So today I shared some of my researches and also I, my perspectives uh, on uh, the emerging technologies such as by facial solar PV technology and uh, uh, how uh, solar PV thermal technology and also if our modules can be self-cleaned, can be self-cooled and also it can be colored. Okay, so therefore uh, we can see with such solutions, definitely I, I, I have a very bright view of uh, BIPV technology. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Liu. And uh, we got some idea from you that the utilization of the solar energy, like you have, you know, also have some measures to like uh, remove the particles and make the, you know, dirty panels, make it clean. And thank you very much. Um, thank you. You know, I really appreciate it for our time. So let's go to the next presenter is the Sarah Kukis and uh, Let's introduce her a little bit. And she is the lead author of the, uh, you know, first she worked in the Royal Institute of Technology of the Geo, Geo, sorry, the Geo, Jogenton University and uh, in the Turkey. And uh, she is the lead author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Six Assessment Report in the AR6 you know, the very famous for the climate change administration. And she is also the senior researcher and advisor for the president at the Scientific and the Technology Research Council of Turkey, and also the associate editor for many journals and also the uh, editorial board members in the, our, you know, founded by the journal, you know, Energy Storage and Saving in Xianjiao University and also she is the guest editor in the Energy Communication of Management, the ECM journal. And uh, her topic today is about the transforming education and the higher education institution for a climate natural future. And let's welcome Sarah. Thank you very much, Professor Chu and distinguished colleagues. Greetings to everyone in our uh, session on regional global cooperation. Uh, this presentation will focus on how we transform education and our institutes uh, for our future, for our climate future. And I hope it gives some perspectives on education action for a sustainable climate uh, neutral future. So in our recent IPCC report, uh, it's clear that uh, greenhouse gas emissions are still rising. And when we look at the average of the uh, uh, previous 10 years over the one other uh, previous 10 years, the annual average of greenhouse gas emissions is about 9.1 gigatons CO2 equivalent higher than uh, the previous decade. So there needs to be some system transformation. We cannot do things as we have done them before. The system transformations can guide us on how to make a shift to a more uh, sustainable climate future. And when we look at the trend for the implemented policies, uh, versus those claimed in the nationally determined contributions all around the world, we also see there's an implementation gap. But not only an implementation gap, there's also a second type of gap, and this is the emissions gap. Because if even all the commitments are uh, delivered, this can only limit global warming to about two degrees Celsius. But what we need uh, to preserve our, our environment, our earth system, is to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius with no limited overshoot. And this requires a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by about 43% by 2030. So how do we close both the implementation gap and the emissions gap to increase the ambition? In the weeks of this month at COP27, at the Science for Climate Action Pavilion, uh, we have been emphasizing our, the findings of the IPCC report and also using this as a guide to use science as a guide to increase the ambition for climate action, also based on the recent report of mitigation of climate change. And when we look at the report, 
in the part on system transformations to limit global warming. We also see an emphasis on urban areas, how they can transform for resource efficiency and bring the world towards net zero emissions. And also at COP27, based on the three IPCC reports, so the physical science spaces, the adaptation and the mitigation, three volumes of summary for urban policymakers were launched at COP27. So when we look at urban, what is urban? It has layers of energy with a role for electrification, re renewables, land use, which can reduce the energy uh, 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 supply or energy demand. Uh, and all of this can integrate of how we balance the supply and demand of energy for decarbonization. But in all of this, a question that also relates to our submit is, is there also a key role for education and university campuses? And the answer to this is yes, a definitely yes. Because universities, they are embedded in urban systems. They are a part of cities and where we live, where we work, and where we receive the education, where we teach the education. And also what we do in the university campuses can show a direction for what the city can do, what the country can do. And all the research has been shared in the session also holds so much promise. And if we see our campuses as a living lab, uh, where can demonstrate these technologies, the new uh, developments, and where we can integrate them for a climate neutral future. That's a very powerful impact on what we can achieve. This is coming from the campus, Middle East Technical University, Ankara, Turkey. And each semester with the students, what we do is we develop ideas of how we can transform our campus. And this is another way of transforming education for a climate neutral society. So, for example, in our campus, uh, we look at uh, how energy, water, and waste management can be increased, and Turkey has a zero waste target. So the campus is trying to support the zero waste target of our country. And also, uh, there's a global effort for Race to Zero. Many universities, many cities, many businesses have partnered to the Race to Zero. And we're also looking at how we can bring our campus to support this target, also with the uh, focus on photovoltaic and photovoltaic thermal as also emphasized by Professor uh, Liu, the PVT facilities, how we can increase this at the uh, largest rooftops and other areas, and also how the heating and cooling networks can meet the energy demands of not one building, but a cluster of buildings, and maybe throughout the campus, how these networks, low temperature can be diffused. And another aspect of transforming education for our climate neutral society, uh, bringing the ideas of the students, how they can transform the campus to reduce reliance on fossil fuels, increasing renewable energy, increasing water efficiency because of the energy water nexus. And every semester, we do a participatory approach to our campus, asking how we can transform our university. And year by year, some of these ideas are also being realized on the campus. And uh, here uh, is also a picture of the climate ambassadors uh, working to uh, transform universities all across uh, Turkey. And the new Center on Climate Change and Sustainability just established last month uh, is established and it's uh, trying to support science for climate action, also on the impacts, so the impacts of climate change, but most importantly, because we need mitigation for adaptation, there are limits to adaptation, also reducing the greenhouse gas emissions for climate, uh, climate mitigation, so the renewables, uh, all of this is uh, going to be emphasized. We have been working on these areas, but now a dedicated center on climate change and sustainability is launched to support this. And we have three campuses in Ankara, in Mersin, and Güzelyurt, and all three campuses will be working uh, for climate change and sustainability now. Very recently, uh, the um, government also launched an initiative for 10 pilot universities to become the sustainable, energy efficient, and climate friendly universities that we need. And this uh, Middle East Technical University is one of the 10 pilot universities with a leading role. And these sustainable and climate friendly campuses for transformation universities will substantially increase renewable energy with uh, solar PV and or PVT applications, utilize organic waste, efficient use of energy resources, and disseminate the zero waste practices in our communities. Uh, as a second university that I have been teaching, this is Bashkent University and also in Ankara. Uh, these were energy engineers, one of the first programs in sustainable energy engineering. Uh, and these students were again actively engaged 
in workshops of how we can transform the university for not only a climate neutral future, but a net zero exergy campus. Exergy, which you may know is the quality of energy. So not only do we think about the amount of energy, but also how the quality, for example, electricity very high uh, versus low temperature, low exergy, how these exergies can be matched on the campus to save energy, save exergy, and also the CO2 emissions. So a net zero exergy campus is those that equate the annual amounts of on-site energy use and supply on an annual basis. So there might be some excess, uh, but throughout the year it's balanced. And uh, some of the ideas that the students generated through the semesters were relating to different uh, uh, forms of renewable energy on campus, uh, relating to electrified transport, but also tram for city campus uh, transport, an innovative design for that, and also um, uh, different uh, renewable energy uh, uh, technologies and applications on different surfaces of the university. And we can see that there are different impacts on uh, an, an, an providing energy economy for the university. And I'm glad to say that uh, in uh, less than seven years, an idea has starting from the uh, course uh, and the uh, workshop has been realized. And this is uh, on the surfaces of the uh, building and also on some of the uh, parking areas. Uh, there's over 4,000 panels in this and other parts of the campus. And total is about 1.9 um, megawatts of installed solar capacity. And this is meeting about 43% of the university uh, electricity. Yes, there are other universities around the world, for example, giving 112% uh, uh, of the uh, electricity from renewables. Uh, but this is, again, a good start for the university to come to climate neutrality. In the different nexus approaches that we need for sustainable development, the energy, water, food, education nexus is also important. And in this uh, paper from Nature Sustainability, this has been emphasized, the energy, water, food, education nexus. And this is based uh, on what we have done in the university courses. Uh, so what I have shown before on the participatory education to transform the universities. And if we look closer into this uh, publication, uh, focusing on also the education nexus, what we are trying to do is we do a resource scanning. What are the resources available at a, a university campus? Uh, solar, wind, waste, bioenergy, and then the exergy matching, because each one of these resources based on temperature that they can provide have different levels of exergy. And what is important is that we match these exergy levels to different demands on campus for heating, cooling, electricity, even for uh, irrigation because of the water nexus, heating for greenhouses uh, because we have agricultural uh, degrees and there are research for this and other potential solution areas. So whatever the university has, we're trying to do an exergy matching across the campus to bring also the university to the climate neutrality. And one of our universities, they had a uh, university-owned dairy farm, and the bioenergy was uh, proposed to be utilized to support the, the campus energy demands. Uh, in the status conferences, also uh, special sessions on sustainable campuses and communities have been organized, bringing together many case studies from around the world, uh, from east to west, everywhere. And when we look at these examples, for example, we see, see this one that was uh, presented from the University of Lüneburg. Uh, the first climate neutral university campus for heat, electricity, cars, and also business trips. Uh, they had biomethane powered combined heat and power, photovoltaics, uh, different types, innovative facades, uh, low grade heat and thermal energy storage, and also high temperature aquifer thermal energy storage. And all of this was integrated and realized to make the university climate neutral. Then uh, there's a new part in Stockholm. This is called Albano District. It's shared by two universities, Stockholm University and KTH Rural Institute Technology. And from the start, this part of the campus was made into a, a socio-ecological urban uh, part of the uh, campus, commitment to sustainability, including what the materials are for, for these buildings, uh, the solar photovoltaic panels, and also geothermal energy. And overall, uh, this is also being supported uh, by a thesis uh, by Kong Kwang uh, in uh, KTH. Uh, they, are, they are also uh, co-advised. And overall, this part is a campus for 15,000 students and researchers. 
And not only this part of the campus, Albana district, but also buildings in uh, existing buildings in KTH Rho Institute Technology. Uh, we looked into how uh, we could also do an exergy matching. And uh, Ford selected uh, eight uh, buildings in KTH, 10 buildings in Albano, and transforming the energy system. Uh, we could involve uh, uh, 16 gigawatt hour energy, 9.6 gigawatt hour exergy savings, and about uh, uh, 3,000 tons of CO2 emissions coming from uh, heat supply from solar collectors, electricity and heat from photovoltaic thermal panels, seawater-based heat pumps uh, next to the uh, sea, and new biofuel combined heat and power unit, and large-scale uh, ATS for summer heat uh, seasonal storage. Now for uh, uh, TU Delft, uh, a similar mapping now of, of uh, the exergy levels in different buildings. So this is a reference uh, 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 scenario. For example, this is a data center using entirely electricity with a very high uh, Carnot factor. So all of the electricity one uh, with a Carnot factor of one is being used by data center, but a, with a lot of waste heat. Other buildings using thermal energy, but coming from natural gas in the reference case. So how we could transform this campus and the energy use of the buildings uh, on, on campus. So different scenarios with different levels of renewable energy, low temperature district heating networks, they, they were calculated for each one of these buildings. And uh, this is now a transformation of another scenario with increasing uh, uh, low temperature district heating network. Um, some of the Carnot factors of the buildings that are becoming lower, uh, which is desirable because more low exergy resources are being used. This is the most favorable scenario with higher shares of uh, low temperature supply and the most favorable uh, supply from a exergy perspective at least and uh, how the university buildings can be transformed. So scenarios for the university campuses to increase renewable energy and lower extra demands are promising, not only for TU Delft, but many other camps as well. Now, uh, after that research, TU Delft is aiming by 2030 to be CO2 neutral, circular, climate adaptive, and contribute to the quality of life for its users and for nature. So in the keynote presentation, also how we can learn from nature, uh, it's very relevant for our universities while they're transforming uh, their, their uh, landscape for our climate future. So when we start from university campuses, districts, urban areas, countries worldwide, they can support how our approach, our approach to reaching uh, uh, climate neutrality with a more bottom-up perspective and support what the countries are setting at their national level, their targets, universities can provide the support. So countries reaching net zero will also require university campuses, districts, and cities reaching net zero in order to support this target and guide, guide the process. And there are many other examples. When we look at the roadmap for the key necessities in higher education, we can say that there are three basic strategies. These strategies can, uh, first, we need to act on the opportunities for transforming higher education institutes into climate neutral campuses and part participatory education workshops, engaging the student ideas are a very promising way of making this happen. So we can act on the opportunities. Then we can also transform education for mobilizing human resource because the human resource of today uh, are the leaders of tomorrow and even now. Uh, so how we transform the education, the knowledge, uh, the way of finding solutions, they can transform our society for a climate neutral future. Then third, which is also bringing the first two strategies together, is we need to champion a vision for action-oriented research and collaboration regionally, globally, for transforming society. Because scale by scale, we need to upscale what we can do. And this can also be realized and what we are doing now in the submit by the University Alliance of the Silk Road. So hopefully our collaboration also bringing our universities to climate neutrality will increase all around uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, the Silk Road, with many more universities uh, contributing to this vision. So we can, uh, as a higher education institutes, we need to act upon the opportunities for climate neutrality and mobilize resources for the net zero society that we urgently need. So thank you very much. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, I I saw that the application in the like typical campus, eventually, you know, in the 
Philos University, that's the application for like the uh, carbon neutrality that can be reached. That's a very typical application. And thank you very much for your sharing our this idea. Okay, so uh, next we will go to the panel discussion. So basically we got some uh, questions from our audience that uh, I will share to all of you in the first, uh, you know, presentation. So wait a moment. So, okay. So first is for Professor Paul Auckland. And this question is the, uh, thanks for very much for Paul and for your powerful presentation. Powerful. Okay. So my question is, do you have representatives in Africa? And uh, the audience is from the Yondong Cameroon. That's the, I think there's a region in the Africa. Do you have the representatives in Africa? No, actually no, but maybe it would be a good idea to to uh, expand this uh, network and to make this implementation in other other countries so uh, i'm happy to contact okay i think you can you know the like uh, to talk with the uh, we have the, your email to you know the uh, widespread yes. to the audience and he will contact you later and the second one is for professor lu and uh, thank you very much for the presentation on solar energy, Professor Liu. And the question is, it's very interesting and uh, we'll wish to know who is the partner with your organization in this project? And uh, what's the, I think the audience wanted to know what's the next step or the development of this project is. Uh, okay, it's very good question. In fact, at the moment, so by facial, I don't have any collaboration, but for solar PVT, I'm collaborating uh, with uh, Professor uh, Chiu Wang Wang from Xi'an Jiao Tong University. Uh, it's uh, still a uh, new start. So for all my uh, dimension by facial, colored, and uh, and uh, solar PVT, new technology, I think it's ongoing. It's always new start. I'm also looking for collaboration from all of you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Liu. We also send your the emails, share email to the, our audience. So I have sure. one question for Professor Ying Yan. I saw she is uh, you know still online and she has lecture and you know, uh, Professor Yan introduced the we learn from nature. So the nature, so you know, from like uh, the uh, nuclear boiling, like the energy energy storage, the process, and uh, but usually we wanted to develop the nature, but we only learn from the nature. So what's the like the you know like critical some uh, which the aspect we should learn and which the which the aspect we should to further develop I, I think uh, that's the most important uh, we can learn from nature the how to um you know uh, get in the harmonious society and uh, uh how to get used to the the environment um so the nature the plant or animals they they evoluted uh millions of millions of years and they are uh, getting used to the environment and the best uh, uh you know uh, getting used to and getting what's called the, the most suitable and sustainable uh, they are not a waste they are best uh, optimized the use in the resources uh, so that is a, a thing so we we should learn from you know the nature plant or animals so uh you know uh, that is uh, i think nowadays we could learn Yes, it's a, but basically the question is for, you know, my uh, understanding is to like we dig the oil from the uh, underground, but we wanted to use it like more sustainable. But basically this is a, a crisis, like a very not sustainable way to use it as a sustainable way, <laughs> right? Okay, thank you very yeah. much. And the, the last question is for Sarah. So, the roadmap 
that you analyze it in the campus. So what's the final target of the, in the, such as in the case study in Pilos University? What's your final target? And uh, uh, we, uh, when can you reach this target? Yes. So even by uh, uh, 2030, uh, so the campus are targeting the climate neutrality by 2030, which is 20 years before the countries or uh, so in Turkey, it's uh, 2053, we are setting the net zero target. But eventually, whatever the time, so before 2030, 2040, but as quickly as possible, the eventual target is to reach climate neutrality as quickly as possible and support the countries to reach their target as well. And uh, in COP27 also, uh, there are different pavilions, so IPCC, but also China. And uh, there you could also see the uh, book uh, of President Xi Jinping on the harmonious society. Uh, so I think eventually what we need is a transformation of education, society, of our campuses to reach this harmonious society for the climate neutrality. Okay, thank you very much, sir. And, uh... Okay, I think the times, uh, you know, the we have a broadcast to all over the world of the researchers, so the time is limited, so we have to uh, end this webinar. And uh, thank you very much, Professor Yan, Professor Auckland, and Professor Liu, and also Professor Sira. So uh, we do hope we can, you know, uh, our audience can learn from our this webinar and to make the like cooperation or calibration from the uh this 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 opportunity to take this opportunity to make our combination together to further collaborate and uh, to make a future much better much sustainable uh not only in china but also in all over the world to spread our ideas to the audience to the researchers and uh, thank you very much and uh Really appreciate for your time. Thank you. It, because I know that the time is not very friendly in the Europe side. And uh, thank you very much.